do. This is a joint briefing on two uh, very important critical elections for Latin America that are coming up in the next few months. Um, Honduras' election uh, at the end of November, November 24th, uh, and then El Salvador's election um, on February 4th of next year. And as our speakers are going to explain today, uh, these elections are very high stakes. There are a lot of challenges. And I think one of the common things about these elections is that uh, they involve movements uh, that uh, the US government has, at times in history, and sometimes in very recent history, had somewhat problematic relations with. And um, there are feelings within those countries that the US has sometimes interfered uh, in the internal politics in an unfair and undue manner. Um, so those are topics that we're going to examine today. So I'm Alex Main from the Center for Economic and Policy Research here in Washington. We're a small think tank that deals mainly with economic issues, both on the national and international front. But we also pay attention to the US uh, foreign policy, uh, particularly in Latin America. And we paid a lot of uh, attention to Honduras ever since the uh, 2009 coup. Um, you can follow our sort of regular monitoring of the situation there on our America's blog on our website, which is www.cepr.net. We are going to break this into two parts, with first um, presentation on El Salvador uh, by Hector, and then um, our two human rights defenders from Honduras who are here for the Inter-American Commission uh, hearings that are taking place this week. We're going to talk about Honduras. Um, and my colleagues from the uh, committee uh, uh, support for the people of El Salvador, CISPAS, uh, is going to briefly introduce uh, the section dealing with El Salvador. I'll briefly introduce uh, the part on Honduras. Uh, but before we get started, I'd just like to thank uh, the people that helped make this happen, in particular the Congressional Progressive Caucus, uh, Brad Bauman and Yesenia Chavez, uh, the staffers there that um, help put this all together. Um, and we'd like to thank our translators back here, uh, Rosa and Nico. Um, and they'll be doing a terrific job, I'm sure, and uh, I've asked our panelists not to speak too quickly uh, to make it easier for everyone. Um, and yeah, yeah, I'd like to thank CISPIS for also doing a lot to help make this happen. Um, so, Alexis, what are your thanks? Thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is Alexis Sambalas. I work with the Committee on Solidarity with People of El Salvador in our Washington, D.C. office. CISPIS is a national grassroots organization that's been working since 1980 um, and started to end U.S. military support for the Salvadoran military in 1980 and has continued to work um, with the Salvadoran social movement to try and effect a more just, humane, and equitable and respectful relation between the United States and El Salvador. Um, and I think I, I really agree with, with what Alex said. I think what's going to be interesting to hear about this morning is both some of the um, parallels that we'll hear about, about what's going on in Honduras and in El Salvador. Notably, I think the very strong, diverse, vibrant, grassroots pro-democracy movements that are there in those countries, but also some very significant divergences that have happened in the country over the last few years. And 2009 was a very um, remarkable year in both countries. And in El Salvador, 2009 was the year when the country elected its first progressive president, Mauricio Funes, just a month later, the progressive president of Honduras, Manuel Zelaya, was deployed in the military. So that summer in 2009 has really taken the country to the two countries, neighboring countries, in very different directions. So we'll hear um, from, from our panelists about the social, political, and economic factors that have contributed to that and what it means in terms of challenges and opportunities for the coming elections. But it's my, my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Hector Perla who um, is a professor of Latin American and Latino studies at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, his research um, has focused a lot on the, on the often overlooked leadership of Central American actors, of refugees and immigrants in the powerful internationalist movements that challenged 
Reagan's <coughs> policies in Central America. Um, and he himself continues to play a leadership role in contemporary democracy movements in Central America, has been an elections observer in El Salvador, and has worked previously with congressional leaders to advance a foreign policy position that support real democracy and social justice. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Alexis. Um, so I don't know, kind of, I feel weird presenting, sitting down as a kind of a professor. I'm always like on my feet, so I apologize I have to stand up. Um, so I wanted to start off by telling you guys a story, right? It's, it's a personal story that I think conveys the importance of why I'm here, why we're here. Um, and then I'll do the, 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 the kind of analytic presentation and hopefully it'll fill in gaps in the information that might be missing here. So in 2003, I was a, a graduate student at UCLA, and my grandfather, who is currently, who is now 91 years old, and lives in El Salvador, was visiting the United States. It was the last time he came, so he was, what, 80-something, 80 84 at that time. He had been an immigrant here in the United States and had gone back. He uh, worked as a longshoreman in San Francisco. He was a longtime union uh, member. Um, and in 2004, we were talking about the upcoming 2004 elections, and he was really excited that he was going to be able to vote for the first time for a, a leftist candidate. Somebody, you know, my grandfather's kind of old school, much he's that socially conservative, but on bread and butter issues, he was he wanted to vote for this guy, who, uh, longtime leader in the leftist uh, party of, of El Salvador, Charlie Panda. And then, you know, so I was like, wow, okay, my grandpa's finally going to get a chance to vote for someone that, that he thinks will represent him. But a, a year later, when I, after the election, Hamda loses the election, and a year later, I, I'm in El Salvador, I'm visiting him. And my grand, I asked him, well, Grandpa, how did you vote? Did you end up voting for him? And he said, no, I didn't end up voting for him. I voted for the other guy. And I was like, why? And he told me, because he was afraid of all the things, all the media campaigns and all the stuff that was going on, this fear and smear campaign. He was afraid to lose his pension, his union pension. He was afraid that he was going to get, never going to be able to see his grandchildren, his children and his grandchildren again, because there was going to be a break in diplomatic relations with El Salvador and the, and the United States, if that from land won. Um, and so that enraged me. It, it, it made causó indignación. It, it, it caused indignation in me, and I was I vowed that they would never do that to us again, right? And I would do all of my power to, to kind of educate, spread the word about this, this kind of stuff that's happening. And so this is the, the personal connection that I have to this cause. So let me give you a brief historical background now on, on El Salvador. So just from 1932 till 1994, El Salvador was under a military dictatorship, right? There were 94, 92 the peace accords are signed, but there isn't a democratic election in which all sectors of Salvadoran society are able to participate until 1994. And so there's this, this period of, of uh, you know, dictatorship um, and then a period of civil war from 1980 till 1992. Um, the two sides, the, 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 the Salvadoran government, which was run primarily by generals and, and colonels uh, who were uh, in charge. And on the, the, the guerrilla movement, uh, the FML, the Paraguay Martin National Liberation Front. So according to the UN, there's a peace accord signed in 1992 that's sponsored by the United Nations. According to the United Nations Peace Commission, the Truth Commission report, over 80% of the human rights violations are committed by the government forces and its allied death squads. Right? And so about 5% is attributed to the guerrillas, maybe 10 and the rest is unknown. Uh, during that civil war, during that conflict, the US government funded the Salvadoran military and the uh, Salvadoran government to the tune of over a million dollars a day, and it turned out to be about $6 billion worth of food. Um, as a result of that civil war, Salvadorans now are, 30% um, of all Salvadorans now reside in the United States. Salvadorans are the second largest Latino immigrant group in the United States after Mexican Americans. Uh, not counting Puerto Ricans who are not 
immigrants. 20% um, of the Salvadoran GDP is currently made up of the remittances, the money that Salvadoran Americans send back to their family. Right? So it's a huge sum, both in terms of the population of Salvadorans that live in the United States, but also in terms of the money and the participation of the Salvadoran Americans in the Salvadoran economy. And there's an estimated 300,000 Salvadorans on what's called TPS, the Temporary Protected Status. Right? It's like a limbo where you're neither illegal Right? You're not undocumented, but you're not a resident. And it has to be renewed, this status has to be renewed every 18 months. Um, and so it's, a, it's kind of a legal limbo. The 2014 electoral um, campaign, where, where, where we're at today. So the elections will be on February 2nd, 2014. There are three parties uh, running. There's two right-wing parties, uh, but one right-wing party, the Republican Nationalist Alliance, which is the, the kind of the far-right party, uh, whose candidate, Norman Quijano, is seen as kind of a traditionalist hardliner. Uh, he's currently the mayor of San Salvador, the capital city. Then there's a right coalition, maybe center-right coalition, called the Unity Movement, and it's headed up by, and their candidate is Tony Saka, um, who was the previous uh, uh, president of El Salvador uh, from 2004 to 2009. Uh, and then there's the left wing party, the FMLN, the Federal de Marquis National Liberation Front, whose candidate, Salvador Sanchez Seren, is the current vice president and former, immediately former uh, minister of education. So, the dirty campaigns, what are we talking about? What's the, the crux of the issue, the main problem that we're facing? So uh, in previous campaigns, the two presidential campaigns of the 1990s, the 94 and 1999 elections, there was not really a dirty campaign per se as much as there was some pre-electoral violence, including, I, you know, sadly, one of my very dear close personal friends, a 17-year-old young man at the time, in the, in, in the, the 99 elections was killed. Um, there's, there's attacks between there were violence targeted at, at activists, party activists. Usually, the violence is directed at the kind of grassroots and particularly against um, left or progressive uh, activists. However, those elections in 90, uh, 94 and 99 were not really that close. The right wing won them fairly easily. Uh, but in 2004 and 2009, the elections, the FMLN kept growing in terms of the number of votes and the percentage of votes, despite the, the, all the, the, the pre-electoral violence. And by 2004, it was going to be really close, a really tight election. And this is when we start to see kind of these fear and smear campaigns, as I call them, um, in which we see a kind of a, a, a collaboration and coordination between the ARENA party and ARENA activists and U.S. Republican uh, Congress people in particular, but even the Bush administration. Uh, and really what it consists and boils down to is attempts at voter suppression. Right? The idea is to intimidate voters and suppress the vote. Right? Change people, intimidate people in much the same way that my grandfather was intimidated to not vote for the party that they wanted to freely vote for. But out of fear, they're going to vote for the other guy just so to maintain good relations with the United States, not get their pensions cut off. And there's, so there's three uh, very strong pillars on which this fear and smear campaign has been based. They are the, the uh, cutting off of remittances. Right? We're gonna, if, if the FMLN wins, if the left wins, uh, the Salvadoran, uh, the U.S. will cut off remittances to your, from your family members. Right? And as I mentioned, 20% of the country's entire GDP is made up of those remittances. So it's, it's, it's the source of livelihood for many families, the central pillar for many families. There was a, a threat of mass deportation. Um, they're going to cut off TPS, right? The, the temporary protective status will be removed, and 300,000 Salvadorans will be deported en masse immediately. Right, because they're in the system, people know what they are, and they'd be deported immediately. And then, you know, variations of that saying they're going to just round up all South Americans, et cetera. Um, and then the third one is that we're going to isolate you like we do to Cuba. Right? 
and we're going to break diplomatic relations. The U.S. is going to break diplomatic relations with the United States with El Salvador, and we're just going to isolate you. And we're going to make you suffer. So these are the kinds of blatant, uh, dirty campaigns. And we have. Uh, I hope you guys all picked up the sheets with the actual quotes that was played heavily in the Salvadoran media. And now let me be clear: the Salvadoran media is extremely, extremely conservative, owned by some of the same ARENA members and families. So they play right into, um, as part of the, the kind of the party's um, communications apparatus. Um, and so there's, there's complicity with, with the Salvadoran media and these types of strategies. So please take a look at the, 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 the quotes. Um, you'll see the kind of blatant um, just attempts at intimidation. Um, now, what happened in 2009? So things began to change and then to kind of bring it to the present. So in 2009, there was a, again a fear and smear campaign. In 2004, it worked. In 2004, it really swung the, 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 the pendulum in favor of the right wing. But in 2009, there was a kind of a, 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 a group of, of you know, solidarity activists here in the United States, the Salvadoran American community was better organized and was more prepared to confront this kind of issue. And so we organized and we did this kind of thing and we met with Congress people, et cetera. And we, uh, we basically asked for, for very simple things. We asked our Congress people to come out publicly, right? We asked the Obama administration to come out publicly and to issue public declarations of neutrality and respect for the democratic process and outcome. And the willingness to work with whichever administration was elected, um, regardless of whether they're left or right, as long as the process is democratic. And it worked. <coughs> Congress people, Sam, uh, Sam Farr from, from Santa Cruz, my district, uh, was on TV in El Salvador saying, you know, answering these kinds of questions of the campaign that was being launched, this dirty campaign that was being launched. Uh, Howard Berman, uh, who was at that time the, the, the head of the Foreign Relations Committee, I guess, over here, also issued a statement. And finally, the Obama administration came out and issued a, a, a statement as well that actually neutralized much of the effect of that fear campaign. And so now in 2014, we're ramping up for the election uh, period just started, the election campaign just started in, in this month in, in El Salvador. And there's already been allegations um, just recently, this last week, um, that the president, Mauricio Funes, has said that there's an ongoing investigation into some money laundering efforts um, that have been used to try to hire uh, lobbyists here in Washington to kind of carry out this campaign um, against El Salvador's inclusion in the Millennium Challenge Fund, right, the, the approval of that. And so we're, we're a little, we're worried that as the elections, again, this time, the elections are looking to be very close, that this is going to be exactly the same kind of fear tactic that's going to be used. And so we want to kind of preempt what we're asking, and I guess this is the, the, the bottom line, I guess, um, what we're asking is for the issuance, we want the administration to, again, issue, a, ahead of time, a preemptive statement saying that we'll respect the, the will of the Salvadoran people and, and the democratic elections, and to basically, uh, we'll work with whoever is democratically elected. Uh, and so what we're asking Congress, we're, we're hoping to have a dear uh, colleague letter uh, circulated, and we do have a sponsor, but it's, uh, okay, so we got a couple of sponsors, but we're asking folks to, to also sign up, that, and that dear colleague letter basically is to urge the administration to actually issue that public statement of neutrality and respect for the Salvadoran uh, electoral process and the sovereignty of the Salvadoran people. Now, how am I doing with time? A little bit more than so just very briefly, um, a couple of things on the, the current situation in El Salvador. Um, the, there's, part of the smear campaign has been, um, and I don't know if, uh, how many of you have seen the pieces by uh, O'Grady in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's, it's, kind of trying to slam the, the Salvadoran government. And so I, I wonder if this is part of the whole, um, and, and obviously I have no, no proof of this, but I wonder if part of this is part of the money laundering and lobbying campaign, her, 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 her op-ed pieces in the Wall Street Journal. 
But uh, contrary to what she talks about in those pieces, um, I think the, the Salvadoran government from 2009 to the present can be characterized by three major achievements. Um, one, in the area of meeting people's basic needs. Two, in the area of good governance. And three, political enfranchisement. So in terms of meeting people's basic needs, what do we mean? Well, there have been a lot of social programs uh, in education, healthcare, and the social safety net uh, that have uh, led to a reduction of poverty of 5% in, in those five years, uh, and of violence, and if we measure violence, it, El Salvador is always in the news for a gang problem, but there's, the government has actually um, done a, a kind of a peace uh, agreement among the gang members, uh, and the, the biggest gangs, rival gangs, and there's been a 50% drop in the homicide rate that's not really talked about very often. And so kind of those are the major, some of the major issues uh, and things that have been dealt with. In terms of good governance, um, we're talking about the rule of law, uh, the separation of powers in an independent judiciary where the, the Supreme Court for the first time is really independent of the president right, and the Congress. Um, and we've had instances where, for instance, the, the, the FMRM tries to appoint a, a chief justice of the Supreme Court, as is their right, but the Supreme Court that's in currently seating says that that person is not uh, able to vote because they're you know, party affiliation. And so the Congress backs down. So instead of creating a constitutional crisis, they <coughs> agreed to resolve it um, and, and respect the separation of powers. Transparency, uh, uh, passing of an information uh, access law, and the uh, prosecution of corruption has increased. And then in terms of enfranchisement, the, the big issue has been, for the first time, Salvadorans in the United States can actually vote in the presidential elections. So that's a huge win for the Salvadoran community in the United States, something that the community has been fighting for for a long time. And then something that's not talked about as much is in El Salvador, there's actually now nationwide residential uh, voting going on, which in the past, it went by your last name. So let's say if your last name was with a P and all the P's were on the other side of San Salvador, you had to go vote on the other side of town, right? It didn't matter. But now, so now there's residential voting. And so this is also has an anti-fraud element to it. Because you know who's in your neighborhood, and people from outside could, don't come in and uh, can't come and vote there. And this was a major issue, even in the last election, where I went as an international observer in 2011. We found a, a warehouse full of very poor, humble people uh, that were being paid by that in party to come and vote in San Salvador because they wanted to guarantee that they would win in, in the capital city. And so people were being bussed in to this warehouse and we were able to find them, you know, and you know, we got reports of it and as international observers, we went and we saw and we brought the police in and sure enough there was a bunch of you know voter ID cards and, and everything. So this is the type of, of, of thing that we want to avoid, right? And the kind of thing that your help can, can uh, make uh, a thing of the past for us. So I'll end with that. Um, thank you very much.